Hello! Welcome to SSC 120, American National Government, the lecture on the courts. We have our 15 study guide questions, as well as an essay on federal judiciary being insulated from day-to-day -day politics, but we still influence them with nudges. Here is changing the balance of the court and the Alito confirmation, which uh, a, a conservative Republican, uh, which pretty well tipped the balance towards conservative. And then Brett Kavanaugh, very contentious, uh, much like uh, Thomas a couple decades before, lots of allegations, Title IX in particular, uh, Brett did pass and is a Supreme Court justice today. And the whole point is that has solidified the conservatives with a pretty solid five to four majority on the court. The foundation uh, of the power that we'll look at, their ability to review laws and how they're appointed. Now, constitutional design. Article three was the shortest. Courts really weren't all that involved in the politics day-to-day -day life. Uh, they were typically puppets of the executive, the king, uh, so there's not much in the Constitution about it. There's a branch, there's a chief justice, there's a set of justices who serve for life to keep them away from the fro and to of politics. Uh, it does specify jurisdictions for the federal courts. And then Congress, uh, through the Judiciary Act of 1789, created congressional districts and has created other courts since then. Judicial review, which was established in Marbury v. Madison, number 48. What is judicial review? It's where the court interprets and can overturn acts of the executive and legislative branches. So judicial review is the ability of the courts to affirm or turn over acts, laws done by Congress or executive orders done by the president. And it was solidified in Marbury v. Madison in 1803. And I'll talk more about that class in, in a, that case in class. Uh, not all countries have strong judicial review the way we have. Uh, we've used it with great restraint and it's increased more in the last, uh, you know, as we've moved forward, it's, it's happened more and more. Uh, it's much less inclined to be done on executive orders than it is laws. So and the, uh, you basically have in the advocates of judicial review, uh, our chief justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and then um, you have Madison, who was uh, going to be president of the United States, squaring off. And this is all about the turnover between the Federalists to the Democrat Republicans. And the Federalists wanted their uh, chief justice, Marbury, uh, in the Supreme Court. He was an administrator. And Madison is the new Secretary of State under Jefferson and in no way wants to connect themselves to lifelong Federalist appointments that were sitting on his desk. And that's what this case of judicial review is about in Marbury versus Madison. The Marbury, by the way, is a simple judicial appointment, I believe, in the District of Columbia. Now, you know, in terms of power and the abuse of power, uh, this is detention, I believe, uh, Guantanamo Bay. And so, you know, what is the power of people to be detained without facing a judge, without habeas corpus? And that uh, was created, uh, frankly, under the Obama administration. And then uh, he, he wanted to, uh, uh, you know, Bush actually, actually Bush started, uh, but Obama did continue it and called into question some of the practices. So, uh, this is particularly about who has rights and when they have them. And it's the courts who represent what's called the little man, the little person who's going to speak up. Federal courts, jurisdiction and organization. Uh, cases solely in the province of the federal courts typically involve the Constitution or some federal statute, something with an ambassador, a treaty, something concerning maritime law something where the U.S. is one of the parties of the cases, disputes between states or a citizen in a state or a state in a foreign government. So those are the types of things. Now, the federal government also has a lot of criminal justice power, so cases related to the FBI, like kidnapping. The organization of the court system, um, uh, number 50, asks, what is original jurisdiction? And that is a court hearing a case for the first time. It's called the court of fact. And so U.S. district courts are the foundation of the federal court system, 
and uh, you find them typically in larger cities. And so they are courts of original jurisdiction, war cases tried, much like the way we'd see it on TV, either in front of a judge or a jury. Uh, they can use a grand big jury or a petite smaller trial jury. Uh, most of the federal legal business is done there. They also have specialized courts. And number 57 asks the questions, let me pull it out here. What courts did Congress establish to adjudicate highly specialized court cases? And in this particular, it's the uh, legislative court called the Court of Claims is one where you can make claims against someone or a tax court. So those legislative courts, which is what the answer is to the multiple choice question, are specific. Like tax law is a very specific law. And you want judges that understand the tax code to be able to work in that area. So here's the federal court system, the 94 U.S. district courts, and see the tax and court of claims and international trade, those legislative courts. You can appeal from there up through the 94 courts into 13 courts of appeal, or called circuits. They were called circuits because literally judges got on horses and rode around the circuit. And then ultimately, all of the attention that's put to the final, the tip, the U.S. Supreme Court, the nine justices. So let's look at the Court of Appeals. They're organized by geography. And number 55 asks the question, what are the two types of federal court jurisdiction? And so the U.S. district courts are the trier of fact, or what are called original jurisdiction. And then the U.S. Court of Appeals is the appeals court, and we call that appellate jurisdiction. So the answer is original and appellate. You cannot bring new facts into a court of appeals. It's more about the process. The defendant is typically not there. You're talking or the plain, you know, the uh, it, it's, it's attorneys talking to attorneys, writing briefs and opinions. And then the usual rule for the Court of Appeals is a Latin phrase called stare decisis, stare decisis. And number 59 asks us, what is that doctrine of stare decisis? And stare decisis means let the decision stand, let the decision stand or the use of precedent. What we did before, we continue to do. They make incremental changes to precedent over time. It's rare for a court to make a big change. If you look at the uh, locations of the circuits, you can see them uh, and where they are. So Ohio, and I worked in Tennessee or uh, Kentucky for a long time. So we're in the sixth uh, circuit of U.S. Court of Appeals. And I've studied those decisions, a very conservative one compared to, for example, the Ninth Circuit out of California, which tends to be a little bit more liberal. The U.S. Supreme Court is nine justices who hear cases. They can hear original jurisdiction, pretty rare. And for the most part, they get appellate jurisdiction. They get it from both the federal court system and the state court system. And their decisions are final. So you can look here, you know, the original jurisdiction goes right there. There's the state route, which works its way through an entire state system and then hops over. And then the federal route from the 94 districts through the 12 circuits. Now, these are primo appointments, Supreme Court justices. It was something I was thinking about as a career, uh, but since I didn't you know, go to Yale or Harvard or some other famous law school, I was like, oh, no chance. So on to another uh, career opportunity. And so we're going to look at the appointments and the appointment processes. Uh, typically, uh, these are lawyers today, very much so lawyers, uh, often have been in law schools or taught for a period of time. Uh, they are not necessarily experienced in, in judging, but typically they are. They have a philosophy, and we always examine their opinions and their philosophy. They tend to be from uh, the power and the elite. These are people who went to elite law schools for the most part. So here we are. Who sits on the Supreme Court? Here's the fine group of nine. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh is top right, as you can see there. But this group looks pretty representative. There are six men and three women. There are seven members, Caucasian, two minorities, and there are five conservatives and four liberals. So if you look at the nine members of the court, the chief justice, a conservative by George Bush, appointed in 2005. 
Clarence Thomas appointed in 91 by Herbert Walker, Bush Sr., and he had allegations of uh, sexual impropriety with uh, people that worked for him uh, in Anita Thomas came forward and testified, and that kind of mirrored what happened to Brett Kavanaugh. So it was it was interesting. Some people called it an investigation, other people called it a witch hunt. Uh, it was it was very very public and very very nasty. Ruth Gader Ginsburg, uh, appointed by Bill Clinton, uh, Stephen uh, Breyer, appointed by Bill Clinton. Those are two liberals. Sam Alito, appointed by uh, G.W. Bush in six. He's a conservative. So notice it's a big deal. Presidents getting to appoint judges. Sonia Sotomayor, uh, 2009, appointed by Barack Obama, and uh, Elena Kagan, appointed by Barack Obama, so he got two, and President Trump, who's you know been in almost, you know he's working his way to those four years, has had Neil Gorish and Brett Kavanaugh, so he's put two conservatives on, and that has firmed up the jurisdiction. So these appointments typically outlast their president, and so number 47 who is responsible for nominating judges to the federal bench, and that's the president, knowing that those appointments last a long time. And then what is number 46? What is the informal practice of the blue slip? And the blue slip is basically uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee solicits opinions from what are called the home senators. So not for Supreme Court, but let's say there's a judgeship open in Ohio, and you're, uh, the Senate's controlled by the Republicans. Well, they're going to turn to Rob Portman, who is a Republican senator, and they're going to say, Rob, what do you think about this candidate? And if Rob Portman likes him, yeah, it's a good job. Yeah, keep going. If Rob doesn't like him, he can blue slip the candidate. And out of courtesy, that name dies. So I don't care who the president nominates. If the member of the same party of that state where the nomination is serving isn't on board, then don't bother. And that's the blue slip process. Um, presidents use this for their judicial agendas, conservative and liberal. Um, there has been some disappointment with appointees. I, I think, you know, the biggest being that Eisenhower, a Republican, appointed Earl Warren, who, you know, single-handedly moved the court to the left and did a desegregation uh, of Little Rock in 1954 in the Brown v. Board decision. And these are, in number 49, lifetime appointments. What is the term of federal judges for life? That is, again, to keep them out of the the to and fro of the political process. Number 53, what is what Supreme Court nominee did the Senate refuse to confirm in 1987? And that choice in the picture there is Robert Bork, who uh, was turned, he was a pro-choice uh, uh, judge, and he was turned down uh, 58 to 42. And so it was a very difficult process. Uh, he was the Solicitor General, so he was uh, very well known. He was also a Yale professor, but it was all about the politics and uh, because of his abortion. And that is a litmus test is what we say for many judges today. So if you look at ideology on the court, uh, you look at, for example, the uh, four uh, liberal judges uh, in the ideology in, in the one side, and then you look at uh, Thomas Alito, Scalia, Roberts, the other. And Kennedy was in the middle. And now by putting Kavanaugh there, you've, you've balanced that a little more to the right. So let's look at the Supreme Court in action and how they work and the control of their agenda and how they do things. All right. So the Supreme Court uh, works on basically they get uh, briefs sent to them, applications for cases and uh, they get to decide whether they want to hear a case or not. It's the rule of four is what they use. It takes four judges, put their hands up. Hey, let's hear that case. And then they open it up for people to file briefs. Uh, briefs are basically arguments for or against a particular side of a case. And number 51 asks, what is an amicus curiae brief? As you can see, the law loves Latin. Amicus curiae is Latin for friend of the court. So, you might be, uh, for example, in a criminal justice case, there are 50 states. So there are 50 attorneys general who may very well write a brief for or against a particular thing. So you get the briefs, you pull them together, and you have oral arguments. Typically, 30 minutes each side. Uh, you can be interrupted at any time, and many have. And it's quite an honor to be in front of the Supreme Court. Then the judges have a conference. Each judge states their own opinion. Uh, the Chief Justice starts and sets the tone, 
and then uh, kind of structures it. And then once they go from there, they assign uh, what they vote, uh, they decide what they're going to do, and then they start writing opinions. And then those opinions, uh, you can anybody can write any opinion, but typically a block of five will write a majority. If there's a group that don't like it in a five to four court, that happens a lot. That's the dissenting opinion. Or you could have someone who goes along, you know, I like the decision, but not for the reasons you said, and those are called concurring opinions. And then you have the actual final vote. The court announces the opinion, releases the decision, and that's what we read in the law books. That is the law of the land. Clerking with Justice Thomas, and so he's longstanding member of the court, as I said, pretty well linked to Brett Kavanaugh and how things work. Um, but this is typical of the, the process, one of the two minorities on the court. We've had minorities on the court since the 40s and 50s. Outside influences. So, oh, yeah, what are the outside influences on the Supreme Court decisions? I believe that's a hey, study guy question. So, number one, you have the government influences of the president and the Congress. The president can try to uh, change the court by putting members on it of their political persuasion. So, you know, Trump has had two, so that is quite the influence. Uh, Congress has probably a little bit more power, uh, particularly the Senate has power on who serves the federal judiciary uh, through the blue slip process and the Senate Judiciary Committee. And then the others are political linkages. So even though you're not voted on, uh, now, by the way, in states like state justices and county justices, they're voted on all the time. But Supreme Court justices, they're still influenced by groups and movements. And so there was a whole movement in the 60s about the rights of poor people that they felt oppressed in the criminal justice system. And that led to things like the Miranda rights and the need for someone to have an attorney if they were in a felony case. And uh, uh, certain decisions of cruel and unusual punishment, for example, uh, you know, not to use the electric chair. And people see that as a good thing for a time, but then how far does that go? And then the pendulum swings back. So you see the law and order group saying, you know, police need to be able to do their job. So those groups do have influence on the Supreme Court. They write briefs, they write opinions, they raise money, the court reads it and sees it. And those leaders and that public opinion kind of plays in. Think of it as a lag factor. There's an influence, but it often takes a little longer than uh, an election every two years, four years, or six years. Here is Thurgood Marshall, civil rights champion. So he argued the Brown v. Board case of uh, integration, uh, stopping de you know, basically segregation, and eventually became uh, a member of the Supreme Court. One of the cases I'm familiar with, Gideon v. Wainwright, where uh, someone in Florida was uh, sent to prison for a long time uh, on a three-strike type rule and didn't have an attorney. And Abe Fortas was his attorney in front of the Supreme Court, won a six to three decision, Gideon v. Wainwright, which established uh, legal ability to have a lawyer, if, especially in a felony court. And he became a Supreme Court justice as well. So that's the path that some of them have taken. So uh, national court is policymaker and the debate over judicial activism. What is judicial activism? And that's someone who uses their judicial power to broadly further justice. Now, I just mentioned a couple of those cases. Earl Warren, who did the desegregation case and kind of ushered in the civil rights movement, the NAACP, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall being connected to it and eventually getting on the court. <coughs> Sorry. And then you have, uh, you know, Abe Fortas on the court, again, a, a champion of uh, people's rights in the criminal justice process. So. Uh, they believe in a more active interpretation. The conservatives tend to be a little more, you know, they're, they're plain readers, as we say. Read the Constitution as it is and don't go any further. Civil Rights, Title 954. What issue was Grove City College v. Bell? It's a landmark case from 1984. Grove City College is in Ohio, which is why I picked it. And it says basically Title IX, which is uh, discrimination, uh, particularly on gender and you know, race, creed, color, and other things, uh, applies to private schools. And so Congress you know, really can't regulate higher education. And so how do they get their way in? Well, you know, uh, you can't get any federal aid like a Pell Grant unless you play by our rules. And then it's, well, those are for public schools. Well, uh, Grove City is a uh, religious affiliated conservative school. And they're like, well, not us. We're not taking that money. You can't control. Well, Supreme Court stepped in and said, everybody in post-secondary education 
has to be and have in place things for Title IX. As we do, uh, we have Title IX officers and Title IX activities on our campus. <laughs> Sorry about that. Structural change and constitutional interpretation. So period one, uh, the early 1800s to the Civil War, national power and property rights were big, people owning property. It was a big thing. The king would take property away. Um, governments can do it with eminent domain. Kings would do it with bills of attainder. Bills of attainder were outlawed. So uh, property and people having the ability in a capitalistic system to own something. Uh, that worked its way to the Civil War. Now, after the Civil War, uh, there was uh, the Civil War and then a Great Depression. Uh, and uh, so that's the 1860s all the way to the 1930s, where the court basically believed in laissez-faire. That's a French word, not a Latin word. And laissez-faire is a political doctrine. It literally means laissez-faire, fair meaning to do, and laissez meaning to do nothing. So laissez-faire means the court doesn't get involved, particularly in the economy. So what is the doctrine of laissez-faire? It's a political economic doctrine that governments ought not to interfere with the free market economy. It's very much capitalism. So period three, <clears throat> is World War II through the mid 80s, when, when particularly when Warren was put in. And we see a lot more movement towards the individual's rights and the protection of those rights. And then uh, since the 1980s, uh, and that would be basically Ronald Reagan getting elected in 1980 and the conservative movement, uh, that there's been more retrenchment on the court, more conservative views. And number 60, uh, what... Uh, what is a criticism of the court? And that is the criticism is that those expansion of rights in period three had no constitutional basis. So that's often a criticism of the court that conservatives say, I need to put conservatives on the court to undo certain decisions like Roe v. Wade, the abortion decision, or Abington v. Shemp, the prayer in public school decision. We need to go in and undo that because those were never really legitimate decisions because they were done outside of the Constitution. Here's the timeline of Chief Justices and their uh, appointments. I would notice John Jay is the first one, but it's really John Marshall, 1801-1835, which set up the national government. He was a Federalist uh, who had that for a long time. And then the biggest one on this list would be uh, Earl Warren, and his ability uh, from 53 to 69 to reshape the court more to the liberal side. The debate over judicial activism versus judicial restraint. So judicial review says we get to look at the laws and the actions of Congress and the president. And it has been used. And, and you know conservatives want it used to keep liberals from going too far. And liberals want to use it to push the government a little further, uh, particularly in the name of uh, the, the little guy. Um, reversing decisions of past Supreme Courts is pretty rare. It does happen. Um, and then what are the remedies? And strict constructionalists, number 56, what is the doctrine of what we'll call strict construction or original intent? The court must be guided by the meaning of the framers and the exact words of the Constitution. So original intent says you look at what the framers uh, said or wrote, you look at the Constitution and you follow it literally. Now, if you're, you know, you follow the Judeo-Christian ethic, this would be kind of the literalist Bible interpretation in a political atmosphere. Reducing damages, and this is from the Exxon Valdez oil spill and who pays for it and the court deciding who pays, who doesn't pay, how much do they pay. Deciding the presidential election, now, this is... Um, you know, uh, Gore suing in 2000, saying that I won the popular vote and the, the election in Florida was decided by so few votes. It was actually called in favor of Al Gore earlier in the evening, about eight o'clock, and then they reversed it later in the day. And so, you know, Gore v. Bush uh, was a political decision of the Supreme Court. Whose electors, Gore's electors or Bush's electors, travel up to Washington, D.C. and cast a vote? That decision was the electors that decided who became president. Ultimately, they agreed that the uh, Bush electors would sit and uh, GW became president of the United States. And there were hearings and people holding up handwritten ballots with 
little pieces of paper hanging out called hanging chad and you know is that a vote is that not a vote it's pretty hard for the american public you you don't you don't like you like eating the hot dog and the sausage you don't like <clears throat> going to the sausage factory and watching it being made it was pretty ugly so the interactive uh what happened in 2018 so uh, this is last year's court decisions, and you can look at the link. Uh, Janice versus AFSCME. I'm very familiar with AFSCME. Again, look at 5-4. Government workers who choose not to join their union, you can't hold their pay. So, you know, you do tax withholdings all the time, and we withhold everybody's pay that's eligible to be in the union. Uh, no, if I don't want to be in the union, you can't hold my pay. Obviously, this is a pro-government uh, as opposed to labor decision. Travel ban. Very, very famous. Lots of uh, temporary decisions to hold it up. But Trump v. Hawaii, President Trump did have the legal authority to restrict travel uh, in what were seven mostly Muslim countries. And then abortion, and that is a constant thing the court gets asked about. Pregnancy centers versus Bereka and, and five to four blocked a California law that required crisis pregnancy centers to provide information about abortion. The mother is Carpenter v. U.S., again, five to four. The government needs a warrant to collect data about customers and cell phone companies. This is smack of Facebook and breaking in and Cambria Analytica. Uh, it's like, what's our digital rights? Digital rights are becoming a huge thing in America today. I know I am uh, very aware of who has my rights. I don't just click and give them away. Internet sales tax is a big one. People go on the Internet, they buy things, buy big things, and don't pay sales tax. So not surprising, South Dakota versus Wayfair. Oh, that would be a furniture company who loves to deliver furniture to places like South Dakota, but doesn't have a store in South Dakota and doesn't want to have to pay South Dakota taxes. And uh, yeah, states can require an internet retailer to collect sales tax, even if they don't have a store there. Again, five to four. And then partisan gerrymandering. Oh, this is interesting. Nine to zero. Gil V. Whitford and Benesac versus Lam uh, Lamone. Two cases from two states, Maryland and Washington, where the maps were drawn crazy ways like we talked about in, uh, in, in Ohio and the one we showed in the book from, from Illinois and Chicago. Yeah, the Supreme Court is pretty clear on that. Nine to nothing. Yeah, do what you want. Gerrymandering is legal. Uh, you know, Congress can decide how they want to represent themselves. So may, you may not like it, then elect other congressmen, I think is how they feel about it. Now, what's on deck? So these are the things that start in October 2019. And uh, you know, one is the insanity defense. People using the insanity defense, are they really insane? Or is a lawyer using that defense to keep them away from capital punishment? And can Kansas abolish the insanity defense? We'll find out. Can Louisiana use non-unanimous verdicts? So if you have a jury, and maybe it's 11 to 1 or 10 to 2, is that okay instead of 12 to 0? Police. Uh, can the police look up who owns a car? And then if that owner of the car is, let's say, a top 10 fugitive, well, you'll bring in three other police cars, pull them over, get your guns out, and say, get out of the car. So they assumed that the owner of the car is driving the car. Can they make that assumption? DACA, and DACA is Homeland Security <clears throat> dealing with children uh, of illegal immigrants who Obama gave a privilege to stay in this country to, and can Department of Homeland Security, Trump would like to wind down DACA, talked a lot about it during his uh, initial campaign. And I think right now DACA uh, goes through 22. And so there's a court case to see. So these are children, but they're children of illegal aliens. Gun control. Can New York City ban taking a gun to a shooting range? I find this entirely interesting. Uh, since I particularly own a home security weapon, a Glock, and I have a uh, gun and bullets at two separate places that I put in two separate spots in my car and drive to the range and shoot. And, you know, in a larger city, maybe not so much. So that's one. And then uh, death penalty. Uh, uh, the Arizona using or non-using current law. So this is all about timing and when you can make a, a use a law and not use a law. So that's what's on deck. So here is the essay. The text mentions those two groups of influencers that I covered. Uh, that is Congress and the president, as well as groups and people, polls. And they can nudge the court. Uh, given our divided culture, Congress and the court have been asked to make more decisions. 
Uh, so select one of the upcoming key cases that we've just mentioned right here. Uh, so not the 18, but the 19 ones right here. And tell us what you think on those cases. And you can uh, go to the link and kind of look at it. Well, we're up to the credits, which means we're at the end of our lecture. I've uh, been an honor and a privilege uh, to do this lecture and the lectures of American government in SSC 120. And uh, we'll see. We have lots of fun things related to this in class. So have a great day.